Hello, and welcome to Candidates Upfront, a public interest election program of Berks Community Television and the League of Women Voters of Berks County. Our November 7th general election is coming up. Citizens who are 18 or older will vote for judges, school directors, and township, borough, and city officials. The deadline to register to vote is October 23rd. To check your voting status, go to vote.pa.gov. That's vote.pa.gov. You can register, change your party, locate your polling place, or apply for an absentee or mail-in ballot. And the deadline to apply for those is October 31st. If you are looking for information on statewide, school, or township races, or borough officials, please use the League's online voters guide, vote411.org. That's vote411.org. And for information on countywide and Reading candidates, please stay tuned. The League interviewed candidates in contested races, those who wanted to be interviewed. And for each race, the candidates got the same basic questions and had the same amount of time to answer them. For the League, I'm Judith Cranus, and let's begin. Hello, I'm Kay Herring from the League of Women Voters of Berks County. And the featured office today is Reading City Council, District 1. Council members act on legislation, set the budget, and confirm appointments of the city manager and members of boards. They need to have lived in their district one year prior to primary election and must retain residency in their district. They serve part-time for a four-year term. The salary is $5,000. District 1 is Southwest Reading. There are two candidates, Democrat Vanessa Campos and Republican Lou Perugini. Each candidate's views are their own and are not those of the League or BCTV. Today our candidate is Lou Perugini. Welcome. And I'd like to start off by um, having you tell our viewers about yourself and why are you running for office? Well, I could say frustration, number one, uh, <laughs> for a little levity here, but uh, no, I, I, my father moved here in 1942, and uh, as far as experience goes, I don't know if anybody running as a, qualifies a, as a historian, as some has called me, but uh, you know, I, I hate to say I remember when, but Reading used to be a vibrant, uh, active community, and uh, with had seven theaters downtown folks remember that seven theaters one on the national register and in all infinite wisdom we couldn't save one however Easton saved theirs Allentown saved theirs Lancaster saved theirs and Harrisburg made a mistake of tearing the Senate down which Steve Reed told me the mayor that he that was the biggest mistake they made but it was before he got elected and he had to spend $30 million on the Whitaker Center. So we wasted a lot of money, and here we are, basically, years later. And we still don't have any vibrancy downtown. And what am I doing? Well, I'm criticizing that because I go to Lancaster, and I've been eating or drinking at the uh, Lancaster Brew Works for the last 15 years and sitting on the sidewalk. You can sit on the sidewalk in the square in Easton. You can sit on the sidewalk in Allentown and they put a, uh, a Fagley's Brew Works in the old Harold Furniture Building, which we tore down next to the Astor Theater. So, you know, it's not sour grapes, folks, but open your eyes and look around and wonder, how come Reading sits where it does currently in juxtaposition of these other cities surrounding us that are doing better downtown than we are. I ask you that. Now, Professor Einstein once said that if you do the same thing over and over again, it's a form of madness. Well, you're electing the same people over and over and over again, and you have the same problems, and you haven't solved them. So. What can I say? You think about it. Okay, well thank you, Lou. <laughs> um, what personal qualities do you have that 
um, you feel would help you be an effective council member? Well, talk about reliability and perseverance. Uh, we had uh, the person who was uh, one of the people that was elected to council in my seat before quit after two months. Didn't like coming into work. She was working from home. Uh, anyway, there, there has to be a, 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 an enthusiasm for changing things. I was, I was instrumental in trying to save the Astor Theater downtown years ago. And I had Al Boscoff and Running Eagle and uh, helping. And uh, we wanted to save the theater to bring a classy thing to the city or uh, uh, support it. And, but it was a good idea for the community, too, because I had a lot of many, many high school students would call me up and say, Lou, can I take a look inside? I'm an architecture student. I'm a dancer. I'm a singer. I'm a play, play the trumpet or something. And it would have been a great thing to have school bands and, and uh, facilities, dancing and so forth in there, you know, on the cheap, uh, on a regular basis. Well, we didn't do that, so, you know. But I think there's, I th I'm an optimist. I think that there's still possibilities to turn some of these things that we have downtown, some of these structures into, into viable entities. Uh, but it takes, it takes a lot of imagination and it takes a business sense that, uh, probably we, we may be lacking in city council, so. Well, the next question is partially related to what you were talking about. The Aster uh, used to be located on Penn Street. Yeah. Uh, Penn, do you think Penn Street is healthy and successful? Well, if, and I, if not, <laughs> what do you think it will take to make it healthy and successful? Well, some of the things I already talked about, uh, you know, I, there's something lacking here. I mean, 10 years ago, we paid two and a half million dollars for the buildings of Fifth and Penn. The bank, the corner, the Calla Hill building is 11 stories high and a few others there that they moved around the corner and saved the fronts. Well, here we are 10 years later at least, and they're still sitting there and they're still wondering, we're still wondering what to do with them. Well, you know, somebody has to go out and try to sell these and promote these things to somebody out there, I don't know, I mean, I could do that, but I, I'm not in position to do it right now. But as a councilman, I could be a, like a wild card to go out and maybe try to develop some of these things. There's no reason why we can't make better use of what we have. But as of this moment, after 10 years and two and a half million dollars, We've done nothing, so you can go ahead and elect the same people over and over again, and what are you going to get, another 10 years? You know, I ask that question out there. It's back to Dr. Einstein, uh, P Professor Einstein. If you do the same thing over and over again and get no results, what's the point? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so a little bit of a broader question. What do you see um, as the biggest issues that will face Reading in the next four years? I'm... Well, one current thing, besides development and crime, right? Crime, where does all the crime come from? I mean, cities are experiencing increased levels of crime, gang activity, so forth and so on. But yet we're, we're taking how many thousands of people a day in the, Mex in the border down in Texas, right? We don't have control of our own border. So a lot of cities, they name themselves sanctuary cities. Look at New York right now. They name themselves a sanctuary city. They're getting 10,000 people a month. They fill the Roosevelt Hotel. They're filling the abandoned schools. The, the neighborhoods are clamoring. They're against it. They can't afford it. They're asking uh, Biden for help. He's ignoring the mayor. I mean, do you want that here? Folks, I'm telling you, these problems, you can't say that they're not going to be our problems one day. In other words, if it's in somebody else's backyard, fine. Well, that isn't the way it's going to happen. In other words, all those tens of thousands of people in New York, where do you think they're going to go? Well, some are going to come here, aren't they? They're already doing that. I mean, our population has grown in the last few years. We're up to, what, 85, 90,000, something like that. Well. It doesn't take a wizard to figure out that if we keep all letting all these people in over the border, which basically are agrarian, and, and the cartels are making 
making money, hundreds and thousands of dollars per person. They're charging them to come here, and they're giving them net wristbands yet. Well, what sense does that make? So if, if Reading is a sanctuary city, first thing I would do is wonder why and, and what are the benefits of doing that? Are there any? And what are the downsides? Well, the downside seems to be more prevalent than the benefits are. I'm all for charity. Churches, and, and there's, there's a human resource uh, setups here in the county. They just put $6.8 million into uh, uh, human resources. I mean, I'm sure there's some ways that we could accommodate some people, but I don't know about five, ten thousand 10,000 people. Where are we going to put them? Well, Lou, so you should think about that. <laughs> Let's try to get through some of these questions because um, other people have had a chance to answer them. But the next one is about traffic problems and parking problems in the city. How would you mitigate those concerns and change the situation? We just, we had a police chief who supposedly resigned uh, this summer. And I, I always thought he was a little bit on a, on, a, on a forgiving side, to put it mildly, because if you go on uh, 9th Street North, the first block, second block, third block, all you see is double parking, right? And then you see nitwits weaving in and out in the city, driving too fast, where the speed limit is only 25 or less, and they're going 35, 40, 50 miles an hour. In other words, if you don't start at the bottom, being tough on nuisance crimes, then they're going to get the better of you. There used to be in front of my building at 8th and Buttonwood uh, speed traps, and the cops would set it up and hide behind my building, and then they'd catch them because there's three blocks on North 8th that have no stop signs. So they'd hit the pedal, and they used to catch people doing 70 miles an hour there. Mm. But I haven't had a speed trap there in over five years. Now, if you don't have a speed trap every now and then, and, and uh, you know, show that you mean business, we mean business. We're going to get tough on these scofflaws and, and arrogant people and uh, uh, these drivers that are just, you know, crazy. Then we're going to suffer. Well, do uh, you think that that's one of the question? The next question is about what are the most important concerns for the people in your district? Is that one of them? Well, and then how do you get them involved in, in helping to make the decision making process? Well, when Dorbert was a uh, councilman the last time around, and they named him again, I came in second, they named him to fill the vacancy when the lady resigned after two months. Uh, he had a meet, used to have meetings. They used to meet on uh, near me in the villa there in, 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 in near the museum. And they used to have town hall meetings. I haven't seen a town hall meeting there in years. And that was about five years ago. I still have a fire. And the topic was street lights on Summit Chase Drive. And here it is, like, I think it's five years later. He's a councilman again. And we have 11 street lights in, two, in three blocks here. You know how many don't work? Nine. Mm. Two work. Well. I'm sure that if that's the case in Summer Chase Drive, there's probably other parts of the 18th Ward and District 1 in south of Penn where there's street lights don't work or there's trash containers that aren't picked up, nuisance things like that. That uh, they have to call and, and somebody has to do something about it. Well, in this situation where we have the council people instead of the commission form, the, the, the councilman, you can complain to the councilman, but he has to go to the, somebody in the city because he can't directly uh, affect the solution because they don't have any authority. Mm -hmm. So well, you do the best you can, but you know, if you, if, it's the old story. If, if, you, if you complain enough uh, to people, you're nice about it. I mean, you know, you get some results, but I haven't seen any results in years. Well, so. here's another topic. Um, <laughs> Blighted properties. Some say they should be fixed, redeveloped, or repurposed. Well, How would you address that That's issue? something that I, I, brought, I wrote about years ago uh, where all these blighted, there's I think 900 or 1,200 or something. that, And, the, and the, they're using uh, community development block grant funds that they have in the past to tear these buildings down. 
But it's costing us, I see some of the times it's $40,000 to tear a row house down or something. I don't know why the city can't get a crew of two or three guys with a, with a, uh, a dump truck, which we have, and maybe a backhoe, and knock some of these buildings down ourselves and just do it on a, on a, a regular basis, like fixing the wall on Skyline Drive. I mean, somebody, we used to have a stonemason on, on the payroll, and somebody go up, goes up there and puts a stone back and fixes it up. In other words, on a regular basis, I think you have to have a system of people that you can rely on to fix these things instead of putting them out in bids all the time and spending far more money than you would if you had your own crew doing it. And you'd, you'd employ a few people, too. Okay. Uh, the other part of that was about, what, the development or? Well, just what to do about blighted properties. Oh, blighted properties. Well, yeah. well, that's what I do. I, I, and then create parking lots. In other words, I put that in the paper before, too. Uh, there's such a shortage of parking where these row houses have a poor back alley and there's two, three cars in the family and there's nowhere to park. Well, the city, in tearing down these buildings on a regular basis, could have the lots paved and then allocate certain spaces to certain blocks where people could park there. And, you know, that'd be a, a, a real blessing for the city to do that, on a, on a, on a, but on a larger basis than we're doing it now. Okay. I proposed that five years ago. All right, so let's move on to another topic. Budget decisions are difficult. Sometimes services that people enjoy, like parks and libraries, are underfunded, and the things that we need, like police and street repair, and, um, can't, and they can't be properly funded. How will you prioritize spending when you vote on the budget? Well, Every department has to justify their, uh, pre present their own budget and uh, justify their expenditures. And then you go from there and you, you eliminate or, or add on uh, a body here or eliminate a body there, whatever you think might be more efficient. In other words, you, you have to fine tune these things uh, to be efficient. I'm a, I don't like toot my own horn, but I worked for Dun & Bradstreet for 13 years as a financial analyst, okay? I don't think anybody else has that criteria in their background. And I'm also a Wharton School graduate, a 1972 class of, okay? And it took me eight years living in Roxborough in Philadelphia to get a degree, okay? Now, if that isn't perseverance, I'd like to know what is. Uh, it wasn't easy working full time going to night school and getting a degree from Wharton School. So I don't think anybody else, even Waldman said that when, he, when we were interviewed, he didn't know that I had that kind of financial background. So I could look at a, a, a bond issue or a, a proposal or something and, and you know evaluate it as good as anybody else, if not more so. Well, um, what are your ideas to make Reading an attractive place, both for families and then also for business? Well, we don't have any lack of families here. There's, there's plenty of families. Uh, well, you, you have to keep the parks maintained well and the, and the playgrounds, and I think we're probably doing a fair job in that regard. Uh, as far as a, an attractive place to live, well, at one time, we corked Penn Street for two blocks here with a, a berm in the middle and, and flowers and pots, and it was a, a haven for vagrants, and the merchants complained that the, there was no parking. So a few years, it was under Karen Miller's uh, time, I think, or before, Kosminski maybe. But anyway, they decided to tear them out, so they tore it all out, and now we have parking and so forth, but we don't have many plants or pots or anything. We could do some of that. I noticed that Bethlehem has a lot of pots around and benches, mm. okay? We don't, I don't think we have too much in the way of benches and pots, uh, flower pots, big things that nobody can steal. And, uh, you know, there's little things you can do like that, and you don't have to spend a lot of money to justify those things. Uh, I mean, to, to beautify Penn Street, make it look more attractive. It doesn't look that attractive now. Mm. So, so, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, why don't, in your closing statement, and um, also uh, give us a closing statement, and what is the one thing that you would hope to accomplish um, if elected? 
Well, uh, I had a, a comment here about warehouses. It's not uh, probably that germane to writing itself, but uh, one thing, there's, there's an article in the paper about the state is considering warehouse, uh, new warehouse laws. But like on Route 10, there's, they're proposing a warehouse at the top of the hill at the rehab center. Well, that's a narrow street, a narrow pass, a Route 10 is narrow, and it's, the sight lines aren't that long. And see, we're making a big mistake. We're putting all these trucks on roads that weren't meant for it instead of near rail sidings. And I want to bring that up. Most of these, if not all of these warehouses, should have rail sidings. That would, a rail car, one box car, can hold about three to four trailer loads. So, you know, if, if, if they're near a rail siding like they do in Hazleton, they have a big rail siding there, which Reading and Northern uh, handles. If you plan that effect efficiently, you would take trucks off the roads, which are beating up the roads. Okay, enough on that. Yeah, uh, so we're going to have to wrap up. Is there one I last I want to mention, thought? okay. <laughs> Talk about inactivity. Let me throw this at you, and I'll close with this. Okay. We only have about Th a minute. Three years ago, or four years ago, I guess it was, the Reading Eagle, somebody, a woman wrote the Reading Eagle, what is the next mayor going to do about the noise and the complaints up at the Pagoda? Okay. So I wrote a letter to the editor. They published it June of 19. That's four years ago. And I said, every park, federal, state, most local have gates, gates in the front or in the back to prevent people from coming in and vandalism in off hours, right? So I said, all we have to do is put a gate at the bottom of the hill and one at List Road, see? And then it's a, basically a park, it's not a th through road. So you put two gates up and you solve the problem. Well, they spent $100,000 on security guards, which was, was throwing money away. I'm now they're still debating that, that okay? <laughs> they're still debating that yeah. about the gates yeah. and they're going to do a study. So I ask you folks, do you want to wait another five years to get gates, which would cost maybe 10 grand or less? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're running closing, out of time. My closing argument. <laughs> well, thank you, Lou Perugini, for sharing your views with us. Um, please remember there is another candidate for Reading City Council in District 1, and that is Vanessa Campos. Um, you can find more information on all the candidates by going to the League's online voters guide, vote411.org. And uh, we thank you for watching Candidates Up Front. I'm Kay Herring. Have a good day. Thank you.